The future of AI is going to be different than what most people in AI think today. That's what Jeff Hawkins talks about in his book A Thousand Brains. And he's not alone with this claim. Some people think that the future of AI is going to be more brain inspired than today's AI solutions are and thus will look radically different from today's machine learning based approaches. If I believe this claim, practically speaking, how much of my time as a computer scientist should I study biology and neuroscience? What does it bring you to study neuroscience besides mere inspiration? The premise that building machines like brains has generated a lot of interest in AI and beyond. Maybe too much though. The problem is partly that brain-like AI or human-like AI evokes a lot of false promises. Of course, true brain-like AI would be big news. For example, in 2013 when DeepMind presented the DQN model that could play Atari games better than human expert players, we should understand it in the way it was meant in the paper. Um. Putting together these sort of vaguely brain-like components can build state-of-the-art AI systems. So we, we have systems that achieve human-level object recognition, human-level game playing, uh, human-level speech recognition. Uh, and I should, should just insert a caveat here that when I say human-level, we have to be really careful what we mean by that because human-level just means that there's some metric at which humans are performing that is achieved by the system. It doesn't necessarily mean that the system is actually computing in human-like ways or arrived at that point through human-like learning algorithms. None of those things are really verified. As Sam Gershman rightly points out, human-like performance does not mean that the machine is performing like a human or has learned similar to a human or is doing anything similar to what a human was doing. It just is a metric level to what humans typically perform to. AI is just matching this level. But what would it mean if you're building machines that generally have human-like intelligence? Maybe it means we are actually building intelligent machines. Is AI not intelligent? According to this view, today's AI systems cannot be considered to be intelligent. Jeff Hawkins, for example, argues that the only intelligent system that we know of today is the human brain. And in order to build true artificial intelligence systems, we need to understand the brain and build machines like the brain. Hawkins and others in favor of this theory don't deny that today's deep learning systems are useful. They only argue that they're not intelligent in a general sense. This of course all depends on our definition of intelligence. Lake and colleagues characterize two different approaches to intelligence the statistical pattern recognition approach and the process of world building. The pattern recognition approach is predominant in machine learning, whereas the world building approach is common in theories of the brain. In the pattern recognition approach, the primary concept is prediction, whereas in the world building approach, the primary concept is building models of the world and cognition is using these models to understand and predict the world. François Chalet describes two historical perspectives on intelligence. Intelligence as a collection of task-specific skills, like the Turing test as measuring, and intelligence as a general learning ability. In his clever approach to measure intelligence, he defines intelligence as skill acquisition efficiency, both in humans and in machines. Contemporary AI lacks this efficiency and models of the world. The brain is more efficient than AI in two ways, energy and data. The brain, for example, uses the energy of a dim light bulb, whereas large language models can use orders of magnitude more power. The brain is able to learn from only a few examples, whereas machine learning models need thousands of examples to learn. This is currently changing as it's an active field of research and in some instances neural networks can learn only in a few examples. And one might expect that fusion learning is of such high interest because we know the brain can do it. All of this is lacking in AI systems today. The field of artificial intelligence has been very successful in developing artificial systems that perform on these tasks without featuring intelligence. To summarize, AI is missing a few vital components to be considered intelligent. An intelligent system should have the following ca characteristics and capabilities. Hawkins in a thousand brains lists these. Learning continuously, learning via movement, flexibility, 
store knowledge and predict outcomes. Lake and colleagues list these. Common sense, intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, causality, abstract concepts and their meaning, compositionality. The question on what constitutes intelligence would of course need more discussion and time than this. But the point is, for the future of AI, that machines are not intelligent in this sense. To be clear, we're talking about a general artificial intelligence. So yes, we should build more human-like machines if our goal is artificial general intelligence. In most natural domains, humans are just much better learners and thinkers. Or as Jeff Hawkins writes, we can't get to artificial general intelligence by doing more what we are currently doing. We have to take a different approach. But how would this work? The answer according to Hawkins is to study the brain and build a machine that is just like the human brain. He summarized his theory on how the brain works and how to implement it in the Thousands Brains theory. This of course is not the only theory and it might be wrong. I personally think it's a quite useful theory and it lends itself to being implemented, so it's worth having a look into it. The Thousand Brain Theory states that brains learn thousands of models of the world. The models are learned by the brain in the neocortex and cortical columns. The neocortex is that part of the brain that most people associate with the brain. But the neocortex is not by itself. The brain and the spinal cord make up the central nervous system and the brain itself consists of many distinct parts and the central nervous system couldn't work out with the rest of the nervous system which itself doesn't work without a body. We can roughly divide the central nervous system in two parts, the old brain and the new brain. Old and new refers to the evolutionary age where the parts developed. The old brain is also referred to as the reptile brain and the new cortex developed much later and grew quite big in humans. That's at least how Hawkins explains it. But the brain is not an onion with a tiny reptile inside it. That funny image is the title of a paper that clarifies the misconceptions about brain evolution and why thinking of old and new brain is a misleading concept. You should seek out the paper if you want all the details, I just briefly explain the main points. The first misconception is that animals and their brains can be arranged from simple to complex in a linear progression. It is not the case that rodents evolved into a more complex animal during which new brain structures were layered on top of the rodents' brains. A better view would be that reptiles, rodents and humans radiated from some common ancestors and the brains adapted throughout the evolutionary process. What became the neocortex in humans can also be found in reptiles, rodents and their ancestors and is known there as a forebrain. Within these radiations, complex brain structures and abilities evolved many times over again, for example in the octopus. The problem with this misconception is that the evolutionary process consists more of changing or transforming existing parts and not so much about adding new structures over existing parts. Along with this misconception comes the false belief that adding complex brain structures also allows more complex behavior. Back to the cortical columns. The neocortex consists of thousands of cortical columns, about 150,000. Each cortical column occupies about one square millimeter of neocortex and is about 1.5 millimeter thick, the whole thickness of the neocortex. Each column consists of thousands of neuronal cells which are tightly interconnected and columns are also connected to other columns but not as tightly as within. Cortical columns have no visual boundaries between them. Scientists know that they exist because all cells of one column react to a specific part of the retina or patch of skin. The cells of the next column would react to a different part of the retina or different patch of the skin. This grouping of responses is what defines a cortical column. Each cortical column learns a model of the world and predicts the next expected input using reference frames. Reference frames attach to objects and are like coordinate systems that are fixed with this object. If you touch a pen for example, your reference frame for pens knows where your finger is on the pen and can interpret the sensory inputs relative to this reference frame. If you move your finger 
around the pen, your reference frames predicts the next expected sensory input. So this is how the cortical column learns a model of the pen and can correct it with sensory input by movement. The model of the pen is extended with different reference frames, for example from your eyes and from your ears, and so you get a complete picture of the whole pen in your head. According to his theory, vision, touch and language all work with the same underlying principles of movement, prediction and reference frames. This is also how knowledge of the world is stored in the brains, in the cortical columns with reference frames. This fits well with our atomical observation that most parts of the neurocortex look the same independent of what function they encode. This idea extends for abstract concepts as well. For example, if you learn mathematics, you literally build a mind map of the concepts and thinking is movement through these concepts and making predictions and if you read or hear about a new concept, you correct your model accordingly. Additionally, reference frames attached to your body tell you where things are relative to your body. For example, if I want to reach out to this brain model here, reference frames to my body tell, you, tell me where they are relative to me. The underlying biological structures for this are plays and grid cells, which I'm not getting into here, but are very interesting on their own right. In 2014, the Nobel Prize was awarded for this discovery. Hawkins is convinced that the future of AI will be based on different principles that are used in AI today. Principles that are based on things we already understand about the brain, which are cortical columns and reference frames. But this of course is only one theory. AI and neuroscience have a long and intertwined history together. Looking backward, there are plenty of instances where neuroscience inspired mechanisms and structures in AI. The Neuron as a nonlinear computational unit is right from the brain and was called perceptron in 1943. Neural networks today, however, use the backpropagation of error method. It seems unlikely that brains are doing something similar, but this is a topic of current debates. To give another example, state-of-the-art convolutional neural networks use several hallmarks of neural network computing. For example, receptive fields, normalization and maximum pooling of inputs. These operations were directly inspired by single cell recordings from the mammalian visual cortex, for example in a famous study from 1959 from Hubble and Weasel, where they recorded single cells in visual cortex of cats. But still, with only a few exceptions, CNNs work on entire images or video frames. The primate visual cortex is different. Instead of processing the whole image parallel, the focus moves quickly over the scene and processes sequentially. What's important, however, is to keep in mind, even though computer scientists in AI are very interested in computational constraints or architectural constraints that they can use for the models, those often merely serve as inspiration. The idea that we're using biological principles in artificial intelligence is often misunderstood or oversold. Looking forward, how should AI researchers approach neuroscience to get the most out of it? Sim Gershman and Chris Summerfield argued that there is a lot to learn for AI researchers in neuroscience, but most computer scientists probably don't need to be bothered with all the biological details. Sam Gershman, for example, as a computational neuroscientist, uses computational models to study the brain. Not because they are particularly useful for AI, but because it's a way of describing the mechanisms that he sees in the brain. The reason for this is that we can't make discoveries on how the brain works if we go into the data analysis without a model of how the brain works in the first place. So as an engineer, you can use these computational models that he described in his book, for example, directly without studying the brain. Additionally, neuroscience developed a lot of great tools that are often not as developed in AI research. For example, how to define good measurable research questions or how to operationalize intelligence. François Chalet, for example, built on top of these ideas in the paper that we discussed before. So to benefit from neuroscience, you don't need to get involved with all the neuroanatomy and biology. Diversity in opinion and cross-fertilizations are the clear winners in the cooperation between neuroscience and AI researchers. 
but I personally find it hard to believe that the only way to intelligence is through studying the brain. I would agree, however, that AI is not intelligent in this general sense. But what is not clear to me is what intelligence is actually all about. If we want to understand the brain, we should study the brain. If you want to engineer powerful tools, we should build them directly without constraining ourselves to biological systems. If we want to unravel the mysteries of intelligence, maybe there's a way between neuroscience and AI. The list of properties of intelligence is quite abstract. This reminds me of Claude Shannon when he went at information theory. He showed that with only two values, zero and one, in three operations, and, or, and not, we could build general computation devices, which are called digital computers. Analog computers used at the times were very specialized tools only used for one or a few applications. Whereas with Shannon's idea, you could build a general digital computer for all kinds of different tasks, with only using a few principles. Because it used only a few principles, they could be optimized and miniaturized that we see in today's digital computers. So if we find similar computational principles of intelligence, we might see the same transformation that we have seen from analog to digital computers. If you find these principles in the brain or in AI, only the future can tell. Planes don't flap their wings and fly like birds. Only once engineers stopped imitating birds and started learning about aerodynamics, did they succeed in building flying machines. But without birds, it probably would never have happened.